Um, one of my passions uh, as an academic and uh, teacher and, and whatnot is actually interdisciplinary studies, right? It's the whole idea of just taking two different disciplines and cross-fertilizing them and seeing what fruit uh, or harvest or whatever comes out the other side. And I've been really excited the last year at Trinity we had uh, Christianity and Psychology as a new unit. And it was quite popular, a lot of people interested in how psychology informs theology and vice versa. And sort of taking the best of both worlds and showing how the gospel isn't something that's just to be kept you know, in a bag by itself and pulled out every now and then and talk about the gospel and then tuck it away again. But it pertains to all of life, doesn't it? And the other one we did was theology and the arts. And um, that was a lot of fun too. We had uh, a jazz trio come and play. We had a, a fiction writer come and talk and a painter painted as she spoke. And by the end of the talk, there's this amazing pastel artwork. Um, and the fourth one, what was that? Movies. Movies. Oh, that was me. Yes. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, the fourth one was uh, I gave a talk about a film and narrative and scripture and how those things interconnect. And I love all that stuff. So. Um, I was talking to Charles Ringmer, who many of you will know, one day at the college, because he's a holy scribbler, whatever that means. He comes in and writes, and he's a, actually an honorary research fellow for Trinity College. And we were just talking, and I don't actually remember this conversation very well, but I remember what came out of it. Because I, I must have just got talking to him about how theology and jazz, you know, there's a bit of interplay there, and some of the things that I've learned in music have had significance for my faith journey as well. And the next thing I knew, I was on the list for speakers <laughs> for these events. And uh, someone said, yeah, it'd be great to have you come and talk. And I, I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And then I realized Charles had been in and wanted it. So thank you, Charles. I noticed he's not here. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And then I'm just going to tinker a little bit uh, to illustrate some things, get you guys involved in some things, uh, maybe sing a song at the end if I'm encouraged. Uh, but I, I should tell you, well, I'll tell you now that um, my jazz background is a long way in the background. So when I finished high school, I fell in love with the piano. I just, I couldn't stop playing it. In fact, I started skipping classes in my last year of high school because I discovered the piano. And I just couldn't play enough of it and I was singing and playing constantly. Teachers would come to the door. Can I see your timetable there, Paul? Yes, it says you should be in maths. <laughs> see you later. Anyway, there was a lot of that. And by the end of high school, I thought, I've got to study jazz. I've got to get this out of my system. So I went and studied jazz for two years. Um, and it was amazing because I just, it all came alive. And understanding how music worked. Jazz theory was my favorite subject because it was all about how all these different things work. And although I then discovered theology and got even more into that, and, and that's sort of where my life has, has gone since, the jazz interest never went away. The music interest never went away. And I've continued to find that listening to jazz and going to jazz bars when I get a chance and thinking about the interplay between lots of themes in jazz music and life has been really rich for me. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those things tonight. Although, I've got half an hour, so I'm not going to get through a lot. I'm, I'm planning to touch on two. <laughs> but over, over time, I've found that to be a really rich part of life, just to have music. How many of you are musicians, just out of interest? Should be more musicians. Yeah. <laughs> okay, how many of you can play a, mu a musical instrument at a very basic level, at least? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And I mean very basic. How many of you could do this? Yeah. That's the start of being a musician. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? You throw me off. How many of you are musicians? How many of you are Yeah. If, I'm guessing that not all of you are professional musicians by your response. Which means that... <laughs> How many are, are there any? I shouldn't ask because it's just going to make me feel intimidated. But are there any professional, professional musicians here? Ah, sigh of relief. And if you are, just keep your hand down. Keep your hand down. 
Now look, what, what I'm getting at is that if you have an interest in music or you ever learned a musical instrument, it stays with you through life and it becomes something that enriches everything else, doesn't it? So let's jump in with some basic music theory. Uh, some of the stuff that I learned when I was studying music. Music, as you know, and life made up of notes, let's say. Low notes, high notes, lots of little middle notes. But it all sounds quite random until we start to try and harmonise and put those, those notes together. And as soon as you put two notes together, you get what's called an interval, which can be quite pretty and sound nice and harmonic and melodic. Or it can be a little, you know, dissonant if the notes are too close together. Or anyone know what that's called? Testing the musical knowledge out there. Yeah. What kind of what kind of interval? I'm just checking out whether anyone has studied music and didn't let on earlier. That's that's a tritone. It's three tones in a row. Sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? It's the sort of thing that. In a dream sequence, you know, you can picture someone, Alice in Wonderland, that sort of stuff. So you have these different kinds of intervals between two notes. Like I said, there's the nice ones, and there's the not so nice ones. As soon as you add a third note to that, and you start to create triads, which as the name suggests, are made up of three notes, you get your chords, and then you can start to make music. So you've got two basic triads, what are they? Major and minor. Major and minor, major. great. Lots of, lots of uh, major chords and some minor ones. If you're teaching a child, you tend to say happy chord and sad chord. And <laughs> the facial expression says it all. So a couple of um, major chords and you can put a song together quite easily. Uh, what's this one? Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. So that's just, oh nice, look at that. Give yourself a hand, beautiful. Who went up to that high note at the end? Is that you, Rosemary? Oh, she's had a couple of vodkas, that's what's going on there. Okay, sorry. I should say, a couple of these guys I am familiar with because they're students at the college. So I wouldn't normally say that about just anyone, that they've had a couple of vodkas. But that, that, was, that was all major chords. Um, the majority of songs that you'll hear out there are made up of those four chords. And I mean thousands if not millions of songs. Those four chords, yeah? And you just put them in different orders, different rhythm, a different melody, and you're away. So when I used to teach piano, I would say to students, you pick a song, and by your third lesson, or second lesson even, you'll be playing it. And they'd say, no. And I'd say, yes. And <laughs> chances were it was those four chords, and they'd be up and running, and they'd be excited, and then they'd pay me for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that. <laughs> so, triads are a fairly simple way to approach music. You know, the Beatles and a lot of the pop music we hear is just made up of three note chords, and that's quite simple. Now, what jazz does is it takes those, it takes the triad and says, too simple, let's make that more complex by altering notes in it and by extending the chord. So, let's take C major. There's the triad we add a seventh. Now you can add a seventh there or you can add a seventh here. Two different kinds of sevenths. The second one that some of you got quite excited about is a dominant seventh. It's the one that's used in, uh, you know, the blues. Those are all seventh chords. the music becomes suddenly more complex and nicer as well. Now, a major seventh, though, is more dissonant. You might have noticed. 
because two of the notes are right next to each other. That's where they sit, a B and a C. Not a very nice sound, but if you spread them out and put the triad between them, then it sounds pretty. Especially if you arpeggiate it like that. So you can, you can create uh, a nice sound with dissonance just by giving it context and maybe there's something to reflect on there as well. You can't really sneak in, can you? Because you're right no. in front. <laughs> Very so difficult. You grab, if that's what <laughs> Thank you. Grab seat. You're welcome. Come on in. Um, so the major, major chord is, um, a major seventh chord is dissonant. But the interesting thing about this is once you hear it and once you get used to it, there's no going back. And I, I still remember a conversation I had, and this must be 30 years ago, uh, when I was studying jazz, I was standing out in front of the jazz school with a drummer. He said, drummer? What do they know about melody? Well, this was no usual drummer. Uh, he was an exceptional drummer. He turned up at before 7 a.m. every day and was practicing by the time anyone else got to the college. But he said, Jonesy, seventh chords. This is the way a lot of conversations start, start with jazz musicians. <laughs> Seventh chords, what's going on there? And I said, what are you, what are you thinking, Dave? What are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, well, the amazing thing about major seventh chords is they sound so dissonant when you first hear them. And we'd all come from, you know, rock and pop backgrounds. But he said that, that sound, that dissonance, the funny thing is the more you hear it, the more you get used to it, it actually becomes what you expect to hear and then, when you hear just a plain triad, it sounds very plain. And he said, and the f funny thing for me is there's no going back. It was him that said that to me 30 years ago, and I still remember that phrase, there's no going back. And as soon as he said that, it resonated. I thought that's actually quite a profound statement. But over the last 30 years, I've reflected on it in lots of ways as I've studied the Bible and thought about big God questions. There's no going back when you discover that something is more complex than you at first thought. And then you start to listen for richness where there's maybe not richness. So if someone said to me, just play two chords that I can improvise to, I'd probably say two five progression. That means you take the second, which is a minor chord, and the fifth, which is a major. And you could play those. It's two chords, minor, two major. But for me, that sounds naked. Like, there's just, it's, it's missing so much. And if someone said, okay, you can add some extensions, I'd be happy. F minor 9 and B flat 13. I'll spell those chords out for you. So instead of that chord, we can extend it with a 7th and a ninth. Ah, now we got a nice chord. And then the B flat, we can go the triad and then add a seventh, add a ninth, and then we can even go a little bit further and add that thirteenth. Can you hear that up there? Now that sounds a little bit intense maybe? How many people find that a bit intense? No? Great. Oh, yes. Someone's being honest. Now the funny thing about the thirteen chord is it's got every note of the scale in it. There's a C major scale, and that chord has all the notes in it, right? Which is weird, because you don't normally pound away like this. But if you spread everything out by thirds, then you get a nicer sound, and it makes a sweet chord. Well, it's a sweet chord that you'll come to appreciate, hopefully in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so now my... Five becomes, you know, big miniature. And you can finish it with a bit of a flourish with some notes that don't really belong. And I'll talk about notes that don't belong again in a minute. So I have found uh, various aspects of my faith journey to reflect this kind of dynamic, this things becoming more complex, and then it's difficult to go back, as it were. And so I'm just going to share two of those, and the first 
as you might expect, is my relationship with the Bible. Um, when I was young, probably like many of us, I just read the Bible. I opened it as a kid and I read it. I'm, I'm a missionary kid um, and my grandpa was a Baptist minister, so there was a lot of Bible in the family. And so I grew up with the Bible and I liked reading the Bible. But when I opened it, I just expected that God would say something through whatever was on the page directly to me. And I didn't think about it much beyond that. It was kind of a sacred text, I guess, but I didn't even use that language. Um, I didn't think, who wrote this stuff? What sort of personality might have been behind it? I didn't even think about what period in history. I knew that the Gospels were about Jesus and that the letters that Paul wrote were for some churches, so they had an audience. But that was the extent of it. Yeah? How many of you can relate to that? Yeah. So reading the Bible, I thought, I'm expecting that something is going to be in there and it's going to jump out at me. And what it says on the page is what it means. So I wasn't thinking about a target audience or a genre, like a literary form that had a particular purpose. And there are lots of different literary forms, aren't there? A uh, shopping list on the fridge. It's not the most profound, but it's literature. It's words on a page. It has a target audience, usually me. And I can't afford to interpret it too much. I've got to buy what's on the list or I get in trouble, right? So a shopping list might not sound like it's very complex, but even thinking about who wrote it, what's on it, how much can I interpret, and how much do I have to pay attention to what it actually says? These are important life questions, right? Preserve the sanctity of marriage and all that. If I get a speeding fine or a parking fine in the mail, which I may have done recently, there's a number on there. It's the first thing we look for, that number. And if I had to pay $287 for having dinner with my family right before Christmas at a River Dirty in Milton, I mean, this is all hypothetical. But <laughs> I would not be happy about that. And if I wanted to then say, I'm going to interpret this data to the council, you've said 287, I'm going to settle for 85, they would probably come back and say, what the heck? <laughs> Who do you think you are? The number is what it says. This document has a particular purpose to tell you how much money you have to pay because you did something wrong. Now, the key question in all of that is, what am I reading? right? And as soon as that question came to the fore for me in my Bible reading, and it's the first question I teach my students at the college. When you open the Bible, what are you reading? Because if it's a law, you've got to read it as a law. If it's a parable or a story or a narrative, if it's a prophecy, if it's a poem, there's just so many different literary forms in the Bible. And so my relationship with the Bible got deeper and more complex. And it complicated my understanding of scripture, but not in a bad way. <clears throat> but in a way that I think reflects jazz in some ways. My relationship with the Bible has changed in a way that reflects the change, the shift from triads to seventh chords, or you know, ninth chords, more extensions and so on. Now when I read the Bible, I still have that sense that this is God's living word. It's going to say something to me because God wants to speak through the Bible. That's a basic conviction that I have. But alongside that, I have this other conviction that it's still an historical document that came out of historical times and places and communities and so on. And what I find by holding those together is that the meaning is enriched. It's more complex and I can't go back. I can't just pick it up and see it as one or the other of those things anymore. So I hope that makes some sense to you. That's the first thing I wanted to share. The other that I wanted to touch on briefly, and I guess this is a bit of an obvious theme uh, in some ways, is the very broad theme, big large theme, of tension and resolution. Yeah. So let me again illustrate on the piano. Um, I'm just going to play two chords, just go back and forth. And I don't have a rhythm section, so I'm going to ask you to click along. Um, with jazz, you always click on the two and the four, not the one and the three, because that's when the drums hit. And to do anything else 
would get you kicked out of a lot of jazz clubs. <laughs> this isn't a jazz club, so there'll be some grace. Can you hear it? One, two, three, four. Beautiful. So this is re uh, release, and this, keep going, is tension. So I want you to hear that. This is the tension, and ah, there we are, we're back on the one. stop clicking and I can't play, I can't play. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is move up, because the reason I need you to click is I'm trying to play a bass line and some chords. With a trio, if, if I ever play down here, I'm in trouble. The bass player would say, get out of my territory. And that's happened many times. <laughs> because a piano player is not really supposed to, the left hand in a jazz trio, the left hand plays the chords here, and then the right hand is free to do other things, fun things. So, I don't have a bass player, but I do have some clicks, right? So, let's go again. And what I wanna just try and do, when I play this chord, you hopefully will hear it resolve, and then with this, you'll hear me trying to create tension as I play with my right hand as well, and then resolve it again. If you don't hear that, just pretend that that's what you hear, and say things like, yeah, <laughs> or, oh, yeah. Come on, play it again. All that sort of stuff that you hear in jazz clubs. Okay. Good. That's just a two chord back and forth, but of course lots of different chord progressions. They have their tense moments and their re resolution. And you can sneak in some uh, you know, chords that add more tension. That's just a major chord. The same actually, it's the same chords I used earlier talking about pop music. But what jazz does is it'll sneak in chords in between. It's a, that's a bit too much, but you get the idea. It makes it quite rich. Um, now, tension and resolution and how that might have impacted my faith. Let me get to that. Again, when I was younger, because we progress through life, don't we? And like music, which is an event in time, you experience music. It's not like an essay that you sit down and read and read again, but music happens and life happens. And when I was younger, I guess my theology, my understanding of God didn't have any room in it for dissonance. What I mean by that is suffering or pain. My life had been pretty uh, straightforward for, I guess, my childhood. And we would hope that that's the case for a lot of our childhoods. But as soon as you start to experience dissonance and you believe in God, you have a little bit of tension, let's say. How do these things hold together? And you will probably know people who don't believe in God and say they don't believe in God because of suffering in the world. Have you ever heard that sort of sentiment? Yes. I can't believe in a God who would allow cancer. I won't believe in a God who would permit congenital defects. How can you believe in a God when there are tsunamis? So all of these different things, these tensions in the world, cause a problem with people holding that intention with a faith in God. Now the thing that's often not stated there is that the belief in God is a very particular kind of God. 
a God who gets rid of anything uncomfortable and makes life sweet for everyone all the time. So when people say, I can't believe in a God who allows this, they are also suggesting that it's their idea of God and God needs to comply with that. And if God doesn't comply, they're not going to believe in God anymore. And I don't want to say it's arrogant because I understand where that's coming from. But it's an interesting perspective that isn't spoken out loud, isn't it? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a, a sense that people are saying God needs to be God on my terms for me to believe in God. Now, when I ask people why they don't like jazz, because believe it or not, there are people out there who don't like jazz. <laughs> Shock horror. No. It's usually the dissonance. Yeah? As they put it, all those wrong notes. <laughs> Which is actually not a bad way to put it. Because if you're playing in the key of C major, those are the notes you're supposed to choose. Yeah? C major is all the white notes to make it if you don't play piano or, or anything for that matter. C major is the simplest key because everything's white and you don't play the black notes. They're out. They're uh, wrong notes or they're outside of the key. So one of the most significant things that jazz players do to create tension is use those notes that don't belong. So if I was to play a major scale, it sounds a little dull, but a blues scale, you know that sound, have you heard that? Now the notes, oh yeah, I hear, I, play it again. Now the notes there that uh, are blue, we might call them blue notes, they're all, they're, they're three black notes. They sound terrible if you just play them by themselves because they're dissonant notes but they're always supposed to take you somewhere. If you play them by themselves, people are going to say, what are you doing, man? That's terrible. Yeah, yeah, I just love this note. It's just beautiful. And maybe this one. Yeah. People are going to say, no, that's not how jazz works. You've got to use those notes to create dissonance on your way somewhere else. So, you can hear it resolving. scale they're outside okay there and, and sometimes you'll hear someone say oh you went outside for a long time in that solo and it means that they were you know doing things that really don't belong and people are saying whoa please bring it back in bring it back in resolve the tension but tension can be created in lots of different ways as we've, we've already been talking about chords yeah so there's tension in that chord uh, and then we talk about notes Syncopation is a great way to create tension. Now, can everyone just get comfortable? Maybe move away from people around you a little bit, because I want to try some things with you. See how we go with a bit of syncopation. If you like, you can just tap this on your, your legs, if they're available. If they're not, use someone else's, or <laughs> shoulders, or the table. But what I want you to try and do is a basic beat with your left hand, Everyone do this together. Two, one. Now with your right hand, you're just going to do two beats for every one on your left. Yeah, that's, that's all right, isn't it? So this one, one and two and one, and is just going twice as fast as this. Okay. Great. Did anyone have trouble with that? So you guys should you guys shouldn't do the syncopation exercise. That that wasn't syncopation. That's called basic coordination. <laughs> you seem to think that I'm trying to make things easy for you. No. So let's now try a little bit harder. Go a little bit slower. One, two, one, two. Try doing three. One, 
three, one, two, 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 three, one, that's still basic coordination, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any drummers here? Uh, yeah, someone hiding? Now, syncopation <laughs> is putting two different time signatures against each other. So this is where it'll get interesting. Okay, let's go slow again. One, two, three. Okay, now we, against the two here, we want to put three here. So not three for every one, but three over the two. Okay, listen to it first. I'll do it up here in the mic. There's the two. Two, one, two, one, two, one. Okay, that's even. One, two, one, two. And then one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Can you hear them both? Yeah. One, two, three, it's even. And this one's even. Now, if you can't do it by thinking mathematically two and three, which is completely normal, just listen and copy. Because I tried this with my wife. I said, is this uh, too complicated? And she goes, well, let's just say it wasn't a success. <laughs> um, so I'll do it again. I'll do it up here so you can maybe hear it like Bobby McFerrin, if any of you know him. And you can try and do it on your knees. So there you go. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one. I don't know. Uh, it sounds good to me. How many of you think you got it? Could you sort of separate what was going on? Yeah, I see some nodding. Good. You can work on that for the rest of the year. It's only March, so yeah. Now that's syncopation, and drummers do you know far more complex things than that. But they throw two rhythms against each other, um, maybe for a couple of bars. So that people are like, oh, there's some tension building here, and then they'll release it, hit the cymbal, and back to the normal groove. And that creates a nice sense of tension and release. Yeah. So as I said earlier, one of the main reasons people have for not liking jazz is dissonance. Um, because the dissonance, but I, I think I think I'd want to correct that and say it's not just the dissonance, it's that the dissonance doesn't make sense to them. Yeah? Because I think when you understand where dissonance is going or how it works. It becomes something you enjoy. My wife doesn't like coming to jazz clubs with me because I'm too loud. And I don't mean performing because I don't perform. I, I'm in the audience. But I get very excited, yeah. right? And I'll yell out, yes, in the middle of a solo. Brilliant, come on. You know, I want to hear more of that. And if there's something dissonant and then it gets resolved, oh, I, get, I get very excited. So I, so I hope I haven't ruin the microphone or anything. But she'll say, oh, you're embarrassing. You're just so embarrassing to be, <laughs> to be with in a jazz club. She'll go to other places with me, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> but I think in life, in real life, everyday life, none of us like the dissonance, do we? Um, there's a lot of dissonance in real life. There's relational tension. Uh, there's problem solving, whether it's you know in a uni class or if it's at, in a workplace. But there are dissonances and tensions that we are trying to solve, but we don't necessarily understand them. And then, of course, there are things about ourselves. We recognize weaknesses or psychological problems, even, in our own thinking or behavior. And if we don't understand it, it causes a lot of tension and stress. And it causes dissonance because we don't necessarily understand it, and it's messing up the nice order that we have established for ourselves. And so one of the things I think we need to do in life as human beings, not as jazz musicians, but just as human beings, is to seek resolution through understanding. And that's another lesson, I guess, that I've learned from jazz music. That we have a tendency to push dissonance aside and just press on. You can perhaps relate to what I mean uh, in something that, you know, whatever's coming to mind for you at the moment without sharing it. But 
there's a desire sometimes not to understand or resolve, but just keep going. And we tell ourselves that we can keep going. We hold grudges sometimes for years. Um, we have addictive, unhealthy behaviours sometimes that we accept about ourselves. Uh, we don't really want to talk about them and we sure as hell don't want to try and fix them. But if I've learned something from jazz, it is worthwhile to strive to understand and to resolve those dissonant questions. Now, an important part of jazz is um, solos. You know about solos? So usually when you hear a jazz band play, they'll play the melody or the head, as it's sometimes called, once through. Might only take 30 seconds, could take a minute or two. And then the different instruments will take solos. Maybe the piano, maybe drum solo, bass, saxophone, whatever's there, sometimes a vocal solo. And the, some of the greatest improvised jazz solos in history, you know, that jazz heads love to listen to together and say, oh, what's going on there? They can go for 10 minutes, building tension, building dissonance, hinting at the melody, but then coming away from it again, and building this tension for a long time before it's finally resolved and everyone in the club goes wild because all that tension has been resolved. Um, now, I've, I'm probably out of time already. Yes, oh well, wow, I'm over time. Oh, that's okay. But there are lots of, lots of different things. So just, just to give you a couple of little ideas, we could talk about improvisation in life. Um, redeeming. I like the, uh, the, the phrase redeeming because sometimes you, you actually hit a wrong note in a solo, but all you have to do is hit it again and people think it's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> but how you resolve it, where you're going with that note, uh, makes a big difference. And I think in life there are ways that we can redeem the mistakes we've made and certainly ways that God redeems them. Playing solos is fantastic, but you need a good rhythm section, a community behind you supporting you. And I think there's a lot to be reflected on there. And of course there's the importance of form and boundaries. Um, you need form to make music and be creative. I did once uh, in church, I was preaching on the law, and so I thought, I'll illustrate it through music. So I got the band up, and I said, everyone just start playing some music. And we all played different time signatures in different keys. It sounded terrible. Mm -hmm. And then I said, look, we're just going to give this some order. We're going to play at this speed, three, four, and we're going to play blues in F. And suddenly, it all made sense. You need that structure, you need that those boundaries, so that you can be creative and push boundaries and find your freedom and, and self-expression in that. So, uh, lots of different uh, directions we could go and maybe I'll come back next March, we'll see how the syncopation's going <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about some other things. But among, among other things, Jazz has given me, uh, helped me to reflect on that lens that I, for Bible reading and a better perspective on handling dissonance. Um, I'd like to encourage you though, as you go from here, wherever you go from here, to think about other connections in life too. Um, not just between music and God, but between maybe literature and emotion, or travel and taste, uh, or sport and resilience. There are so many ways that the lives we live under God are so complex and rich. And so I hope tonight encourages you to look for new reverberations of faith. Thanks for your time. I might finish with one song if you're up for it. Yes. Yes. Time. That sounds like a yes. <laughs> is that okay? All right. Um, this is a song I wrote when I was about 19. Uh, and it sort of mixes some of the stuff we've been talking about with it's kind of a gospel-y, bluesy type vibe. And I hope I remember all the words and things like that. Lord, I know that you have been calling me to come back home.
your help. Come back home.